it's great to be here, but it's a little intimidating because there's been a lot of brilliant minds and heady topics, and I get to come and talk to you about a movie. 33 years ago, Star Wars took the world by storm, and it created a whole new dimension in interactivity, what I would call the way that modern society interacts with an expansive new mythology. Today, I say that with great confidence. Back then, of course, we didn't have a clue. It started in May 1977, when that giant star destroyer roared across uh, overhead in Dolby surround sound and kept coming and coming and coming. And by the end of the film, nobody was the same. It became a defining moment in people's lives. People came in droves, and they saw the film over and over again. It was a true collective experience. You interacted not just with the film, but also with the community around you. And Star Wars created community all around the world. You went to Star Wars parties. You danced to Star Wars disco. You debated with your friends about the Force. And if you were a little boy, you played with Star Wars toys. In fact, Star Wars became and remains the biggest boy's toy property of all time. Three years later, the ride continued with The Empire Strikes Back, and that's when I came on board. In fact, I started working for Lucasfilm the week that Empire came out. Um, that was 30 years ago, uh, around the time that a lot of people in this room were born. What a time it was. We were the kings of the mountain. Empire was a huge hit and made an enormous mark on the culture. People were running around saying things like, do or do not, there is no try. <laughs> Sometimes I do that better than others. Or, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> but was Darth Vader really Luke Skywalker's father? And what happened to poor Han Solo, frozen in carbonite? You had to wait three years for the answers, which is the equivalent of about four lifetimes if you're a 10-year-old boy. But the answers came in Return of the Jedi, and which was an even bigger hit and had the extra added benefit of getting to see Princess Leia in a bikini. An amazing run, an amazing mythology, an unstoppable locomotive, and then a funny thing happened. All of a sudden, it all stopped. George Lucas stopped making Star Wars movies, little boys stopped buying Star Wars toys, and people stopped interacting with the franchise. By 1986, you couldn't give the toys away. The original audience had aged out of it, and the next group of kids was on to Masters of the Universe and the new G.I. Joe and lots of other things. And that was the exact time that I got promoted to be head of licensing. Not a great time to get that job. I don't know if you've ever tried to sell anything that people didn't want, but I thought, no, I'll show them. I'll be the greatest salesman that ever lived. So I went out there to every retailer and every licensee trying to convince them to restock Star Wars. And to one, they told me, kid, and I did look like a kid back then, Star Wars is dead. So I had to go back to George Lucas and deliver the news. Needless to say, that was a meeting I wasn't looking forward to. I really thought it was going to be one of those situations where you know, he pushes the button and your chair falls through the floor into the <laughs> tank of piranhas. So I'll never forget it. I walked into his office and I said, George, I hate to tell you this, but... Star Wars is dead. And he looked at me and narrowed his eyes. And he said, no, it's not dead. It's just taking a rest. You know, a lot of kids really love those movies. Someday they're going to grow up and start having kids of their own. We, we can bring it back then. Wow. That was the moment I realized that George Lucas really is Yoda. <laughs> so the next thing I did was nothing. I waited a few years to let those original kids grow up to be young adults going to college, starting their own careers. And that was the point that we started asking ourselves a key question. How would this group like to interact with Star Wars today? And the answer was pretty obvious. Star Wars is a mythology. It's story-driven. Our hunch was that what people really craved was to carry the story forward. And the easiest way to test the waters was through books, because it's a lot cheaper to write a book than it is to make a movie. So we hired a great science fiction author, and he wrote a novel set after Return of the Jedi called Heir to the Empire. And to everyone's surprise, it went to number one on the New York Times bestseller list and stayed on the list for 19 weeks. So we continued. 
more novels. Uh, there was a series of new comics, all telling new stories, all bestsellers. We had our own video game company, LucasArts, and we started doing S Star Wars computer games beginning with X-Wing in 1993. And again, we were telling new stories. And we knew that to have all these different writers writing new stories in different media, we had to lay down some ground rules. And the most important rule was something called continuity. All these stories had to be consistent with the movies, but also consistent with each other. Otherwise, the integrity of the mythology would be stripped away. The next step was venturing back into the world of toys. Now, the conventional wisdom was that you can't put out a boy's toy line without a big entertainment event. But we thought, no. We're seeing some different signs of engagement with Star Wars. Let's try doing action figures again. And we did. And they were a huge hit. Not so much with kids at first, but with adults. You see, a new phenomenon had grown up since 1977. The adult collector. A grown man actually not ashamed to buy children's toys for himself. So all of a sudden, the juggernaut was building. In 1997, George retooled the original three films and released them as the Star Wars Special Edition, a chance to let parents introduce Star Wars to their kids, to share the experience with them, uh, and that was to see the films the way they were meant to be seen on the big screen. And guess what? George was right. It worked. The pump was primed. And finally, starting in 1999, the prequels arrive. And we start to see the yin and the yang of a new era of Star Wars interactivity. Millions of people around the world went to see these films. The merchandise sold like crazy. It was a phenomenon all over again. Lots of people really loved the prequels. But to our surprise, some people actually hated them. These movies turned out to be fairly polarizing. For a lot of people in that original generation, it became clear that nothing will ever take the place of the original films. But for the new generation, well, the prequels were their Star Wars, no question. Fast forward to today. The Star Wars mythology has grown by leaps and bounds. In addition to the six movies, we're now in our second season of an ambitious, fabulous animated show called The Clone Wars on Cartoon Network. Last year, Clone Wars was the highest rated show for boys 6 to 11 on all television. There's now more than 80 Star Wars spin-off novels with more on the way and hundreds of comics, major video game franchises like Battlefront and The Force Unleashed. There's a whole new play pattern for kids with Star Wars Lego toys and video games. In fact, in the past 10 years, Star Wars has become the most successful theme in Lego's history. And the Star Wars Lego games have sold more than 20 million copies worldwide. For the past two years alone, worldwide retail sales of Star Wars products have topped $2 billion. We have an immersive website that's visited every month by around 2.5 million people. We have attractions at the Disney theme parks that are among their most popular, where millions of kids every year get to role play as Jedi against the most fearsome villains in the galaxy, all to the delight of their adoring parents. Last year, Star Wars was the top-selling Halloween line for, uh, for kids, and even for dogs. <laughs> We've hosted dozens of museum exhibitions around the world, and most recently, a global arena concert tour complete with spectacular special effects and a full symphony orchestra and choir. Star Wars is the subject of hilarious parodies by some of, the most le some of the leading humorists of our time, and it's referenced day after day in the press and in editorial cartoons. The Postal Service issued a best-selling series of Star Wars commemorative stamps. Star Wars even found its way onto the White House lawn, <laughs> proof beyond any doubt that at long last we have an enlightened administration. <laughs> Just last Christmas, Star Wars characters were invited to the New York Stock Exchange where they staged a mini invasion and were mobbed by hardened traders acting like little kids. Hey, they even got some suit from Lucasfilm to ring the opening bell. <laughs> the list goes on and on. These are just some of the ways, the countless ways, that people interact with Star Wars day after day, year after year, 33 years after it all began. Why has this happened? What connects people to Star Wars? Well, 
There are lots of layers to this cake. There's the mythology itself. It's a vast, rich, highly detailed story, a saga filled with fascinating, vivid characters and situations that have captured our imaginations. But it's also a powerful allegory about the things that matter the most to us as human beings, what it means to be good or evil, the power of the choices we make, the opportunity that all of us have to be heroes, the importance of spirituality and interconnectedness in our lives. It touches us and inspires us. And then there's the coolness factor. Yes. <laughs> Star Wars fans may take a lot of grief for being geeks living in their mother's basements, but come on, it's cool to be a Jedi, to fight with a lightsaber, to put on a mask and breathe like Darth Vader, and it's fun. We all love to play with the toys, but underneath the fun, there's a serious side, because as any child psychologist will tell you, the fantasies that boys have acted out role-playing with Star Wars toys for 30-plus years have been fundamental to their development as people. And that all leads us to the social dimension of this connection to Star Wars. The pleasure and fulfillment that people get from Star Wars is something they want to share with other people, with their friends, with their families. It starts as an intense personal and social experience early in their lives. And as they grow up, it takes on a whole new dimension. It evokes a warm feeling of something wonderful and meaningful from their childhood, the glow of nostalgia, and it becomes something that they want to share with their children, pass on to the next generation. And guess what? Their children seem to love it too. And that may be the most powerful way that people interact with Star Wars. You know, a few weeks ago, George Lucas was a guest on The Daily Show, and Jon Stewart asked him an incredibly geeky question, you know, the kind that only a true fan could ask. And George looked at him like he was nuts and said, John, it's only a movie. <laughs> well, as the creator, it was completely the right answer for him to give. But for us, as the scientists and sociologists and anthropologists studying the Star Wars phenomenon, it's really not an acceptable answer because Star Wars is much, much more than just a movie. May the force be with you.